not to be a devil's advocate because I, I like the idea. Funding is an important part of it, obviously. Um, how does that fit in with the mission of what it is that more public service does? It's going to be a question that I'm assuming somebody up here will pose, if not myself, number one. Uh, and, and we have shown a willingness to look at those things and because we feel it's important for us to be a part of this community in all its facets. And the arts are certainly a part of that. But that'll be something for us to respond to. And I don't know how anybody else feels about what kind of questions we want addressed by Bill. But we'll look at all sorts of things. Well, we do have a community events sponsorship program that, yeah, Casey's saying it's all used up for this year. So we budget a certain amount for, you know, and it can be for uh, sports types of uh, events or, you know, educational events or arts events. And we try and spread that out and we use that money and the commission approves that budget. Uh, Casey administers it, does a very nice job. You see the thank you letters that come to the on the GM report, et cetera, you know, et cetera. Um, it's the word is getting out there though, and and so we do a certain a little amount, and uh, we need to get some recognition for that and get a little advertisement, although we don't call it advertising. So okay, Les, please uh, remind me of what the dollar amount of that is. Ten thousand. Ten per year. Did we was it once at twenty five? Well, yeah, we've had some special events where we, you know, we, of course, we used to do the Power Bowl, which we did the hockey day. Fifty percent of which was also picked up by uh, Missouri, Missouri River. Missouri. Yep. Okay. And sometimes there's special events that uh, Missouri River will uh, jointly yeah. uh, sponsor with us, so then we can make our ten thousand stretch a little bit further. And well, we participate in the hockey day in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, and MRS, and, and which, well. I mean, quite frankly. The word got out about the existence of Moorhead in a ver very big way that way in terms of television coverage. But you know, I mean, let's put that on the agenda to discuss it. One more, one more question. Yep. Did I understand that the entire 10 has been allocated? Well, or not yeah, spoken for. Spent. Spoken for, or, or uh, I don't think it's been spent yet. But. No, no, but committed. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you. There's maybe. $200. Okay. In case he was going to use that to go to Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> yes? If I may, um, I, I don't necessarily consider um, the resources that Moorhead Public Service has um, to be a whole lot different from the resources that the city of Moorhead has. So I, I, I don't tend to look at, at, at our participation in it a whole lot different than some of the people last night expressed. Um, um, I, I, I think we really ought to go to the private sector more than we do for things like this and, and, and try, to, try to involve the, the community in that way as opposed to through, through public dollars. The other thing that I, that I want to just throw out, maybe a little telegraphing of, of, of where I'm thinking on this one, this is more personal than, than, than maybe as a commissioner. Um, I'd like to know more about the context um, of, of this project and how it how it really fits into what is being put together from a lot of different directions. It, it seems haphazard to me. And, and so feel free to share this with uh, you know, whoever you want to. I, it, it seems to me that, that this is a good idea if it was um, timed and coordinated with, with a more comprehensive effort. Um, um, more like more like a redevelopment effort that is including street design and uh, streetscape design and an overall context of how it is that we're trying to to re relook and redefine what what Moorhead um, is going to appear like as as we make progress in in development and improvement. Just putting poetry and 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 such in the sidewalks to me isn't isn't very intentional. It's 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 just it, it's a little bit like lipstick, and I'll I'll, I'll pass on the rest. We're, not, of we're the, not going to go with that on, on the rest of the expression, but I think it's a neat idea, but I think it needs to be be more thought out and more contextual to an overall plan that is going to create an environment that we're all going to be proud of. 
So you know, as, as we look at this, I, I guess I'd just like to, to you know, throw that out there that, that I think there's a better way to, to have proposed this and a better way to present it so that it is something, part of something larger. If I may, um, I, I believe there is more context to it. Mm -hmm. I believe um, that when, when the reconstruction of, of Maine and those sidewalks are redone, there's also going to be some ornamental fencing. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe they're even looking at some, some different types of street lights yep. in the downtown area. So I, I don't think it's, it isn't just poetry and art stamped on the sidewalks. It also is a part of some other um, improvements, beautification, yep. those types of things. Well, I don't it, know the exact course, context. You know, and this, of course, is the first that we've heard of yep. anything about this. Yep. And, and it becomes a question of if, is, is it a job for the city council to wrestle with and, and, and deal with? Or, and what, what is the context under mm -hmm. which we would show our support for mm -hmm. it? I certainly wouldn't want to do something that would run counter to the <coughs> feelings on the city council. Uh, and an example that, that is somewhat immediate uh, over in Fargo, when we redesigned Broadway 10, 12 years ago now, um, the, the context for the art that is on the street there, and there's, there's, there's tiles in the sidewalk, there's interpretive panels on those corner posts and so forth. Those are all telling stories that have to do with, with, with the neighborhoods that, that, those, that those pieces are in. And, and you pull it all together, it's really quite a historic tour. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking you know, the, the same sort of thing with, with this. I mean, we're not telling history in this case, but, but um, um, if there is that greater context and so forth, I think it'd be interesting to know more about that. And I think the public would, would probably uh, sign on uh, a, a bit more if, if they knew that too, so thanks. If we put this on the agenda, perhaps you can get more information for us. I, I would certainly be more than happy to do that. Um, if you send it, send it to me, then I'll just put okay. it in the packet. We'll do. Uh, and, and council will be relooking the, the, at the issue uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, it was suggested that the group look for um, private donors, private mm -hmm. private sponsorship, sponsorship, come back, uh, and so maybe the city would do a a a, a, a match type program. Uh, so it's not something that the the city is trying to to dish off, so to speak. Right. I simply wanted to let you all know that there might be some people who um, maybe looking to more public service for to see if you're interested okay. in participating in the project. Okay. Yes. Um, along with the update, and what we'll do is we'll put together a, you know, arts and redevelopment agenda item or something like that. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll work on that. But it'll have like four parts. It'll say, we'll talk about the Heritage Garden. We'll talk about the, the arts project that you're talking about, that the council or talked about and then the water tower project. And then the fourth one, we do need to talk about, you know, how much money we spend on these types of things, because I think that's the heart of what you're trying to get at, whether we should and then how much. Now, just a heads up, when we talk about the Heritage Garden next week and Miss Sheehy and the artists come, uh, we've had $20,000 in our budget for the past three years. And the intent of that was to exit well from the power plant area. And so we allocated $20,000 to do a heritage garden, has some artifacts from the power plant. And uh, we've done in-kind and, uh, you know, contributed legal and, and other things in order to get that all done. And uh, what you're going to hear is they're going to ask for a, a few more dollars. Because I think we're, we've, we're up to about $27,000 that we have uh, expended. Part of which is in-kind. Part of which is in kind. Part of which is in kind. But I mean, we're keeping track of those hours and, and we're being, I believe, generous on those as well. So I mean, 27,000 is the number. And, uh, you know, because we've put in electrical there, we've put in storm, uh, storm sewer, uh, water, we've done some landscaping. I mean, if you drive by, you can see the, the start of that heritage garden. And uh, in the whole grand scheme of what we've done at the power plant, it's small dollars. But I mean, just so you know, you're going to be asked 
for additional well, dollars. Well, then that should be something we put in the pack and discuss under that item at that time. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. We can certainly do that. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, just to but at the same up. time, so that everybody understands, vis-a-vis -vis the power plant situation, we all, when you talk about exiting in a good way, you know, we have had how many dollars spent over there to procure that exit? 2.5. Pardon? 2.5. 2.5 million, which is pretty nice exit, yep. you know, when you look at it, and fairly expensive exit, and our thought was to do at least what we would have done in the neighborhood in terms of resodding and grass and making it pleasant to look at, which is a far cry from where we've ended up being. But so everybody should be aware that we're also looking at some huge costs that we've already expended yep. in that area. But yes, let's make that, since we're still on Heidi's report, uh, let, let's, let's make that a subject of that meeting so we can talk about those things. Heidi, anything further? No. Okay. You know what it's like to deal with the budget committee having dealt with them before, so whatever you do, keep in mind you've got to get it behind by these two. <laughs> uh, to make a point, I mean, I, I love the idea, by the way, personally. I think it's a great idea to, to beautify, to make us a little bit different. And if there's something we can do, we all can do it, then by all means, let's stand But I also like his idea that we, we, we don't know the whole project, sure. but you know, that yeah, if you're gonna do something like this, make sure that you've got a target that you're aiming for that makes sense. And, and you know, having an office in downtown and watching some of these things that come up and they come up with these brilliant ideas about landscaping and things like that downtown, when you put in paver blocks in a part of the world that gets down to 30 below in the wintertime, it raises issues, certainly some huge maintenance issues. Or when you narrow the streets in downtown, you've got other issues that go along with that. So what, what looks good to some people doesn't necessarily work good for the business community. And, and it's difficult to get those streets clean. At the same time, yeah, I mean, if this is part of something overall, and if it fits within our mission, let's talk about it. I like the idea too, I think it's a great idea. I'm sort of on the limerick side, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> Members of the Public Service Commission, anything to report? Mr. Anderson? If no one else says, I, I very briefly uh, just wanted to mention that uh, I had missed uh, the first uh, scheduled meeting last month because I was away on um, MPS business um, uh, attending the, uh, oh, what do they call it? The, Legislative fly-in uh, in, in Washington, D.C., so uh, APPA uh, puts on this uh, legislative conference uh, in the nation's capital every every February or March, and um, um, uh, well attended. Uh, we, we met with a number of uh, representatives, uh, senators, their staffs, um, to talk about uh, power issues, uh, many varied uh, issues. Uh, Bill has shared the position statements with you in the homework for tonight, so I won't go into a lot of detail there, but uh, uh, the, the meetings were fairly matter of fact. There, was, there weren't any great surprises. It seems like, like we talk about a lot of the same issues, um, just kind of reiterating our either support or concern, depending on what the issue uh, is or was. Um, we usually hear really pretty encouraging, uh, supportive uh, responses from, from our uh, Minnesota uh, delegation. Uh, so and and we did again this year, so that was good. Um, so no great surprises, but um, want to let you know that I was there. Okay. Anybody else? John. Just for an update, and Heidi, may, you may add this as far as for EDA. There was two resolutions that were approved. That going forward, they're looking at hiring their own staff as far as EDA, and then uh, relocating out of the city, somewhere within the- Out of the city? Out of the city. City hall? hall. Yes, so somewhere uh, a presence in the business community for easier access, and so a lot of details need to be still resolved, but I believe those resolutions went to council as well. I can add a, a little bit to that. Um, there wasn't any action taken on on either of those two specifically, um, what ha we did last night is approve a public hearing uh, that will happen in, I believe, a few weeks. It has to be noticed for a couple weeks. 
and then the public hearing will, will take place. Uh, we will get the information from that public hearing in May, and so there'll be more step, mo it, it's possible that things would then um, uh, change or not change after that public hearing. Yeah. And, and let me ask a off the wall question vis-a-vis -vis that particular issue. Currently, Memorial Public Service by statute in Minnesota contributes $50,000 toward the operation of the EDA in Moorhead. If the EDA is going to be adding its own staff from a budgetary standpoint, are we to expect that there may be a move afoot to increase the amount of that contribution? And the reason I ask that is in the past it was $25,000 and then it went to $50,000 and I just, has there been any discussion on those issues? No, not at this point in time. Okay. I don't think that, that's, I don't, I don't believe that that's a mode, that's part of a, a, the motive. It would, um, it would give the individual kind of more autonomy and uh, more visibility in the business community. Wouldn't necessarily change their pay, compensation, or anything like that. Uh, it really is a, a, an effort to get that individual out amongst the In business. the community. Yeah. More. Sounds interesting. Can, I can further, uh, there is, has been a draft document for a budget, and there has potentially some changing in marketing costs, and so there's a potential of a increase in the budget, but if there is, those would be covered in the levy amount, because EDA is not reaching the maximum amount of the dollars it can, okay. uh, but there is, a lot of concern that uh, with the going forward, what impact that would have and what cost and necessary change in levy if, yep. if needed. So we're in very preliminary stages. Okay. David, do you want to make you a just comment? Answered. Okay. Anything further? Uh, <coughs> members of the commission, we had a strategic planning session that uh, we ended up canceling recently. No, let me finish. And uh, I, we will go with whatever it is that this august body wants to do moving forward. We obviously have a need to discuss a number of the issues that would have been brought up during that strategic planning. It's very difficult to get these five people together in one place at one time, given the kind of schedules and schedule changes that every one of us are uh, used to. And to that extent, uh, and I mentioned it to Bill, uh, that perhaps what we will do at the very least, is bring up these strategic topics at our regular meetings so that we can have a discussion. I don't think any of us have a major problem with discussing issues that we feel are important or taking a position that we think that we want to take on those issues. And so uh, I think Chris tonight is going to be giving us uh, some information that he would have given us during the strategic planning meeting. But we have some huge issues out there to grapple with, not the least of which are water sources. And when you look at what is happening from a climactic standpoint uh, right now in this region, we have, we may have an issue in terms of drought coming faster rather than slower. And, uh, and, and those are issues we better start talking about soon. So how, what, what does everybody feel about moving forward with these topics? Mr. Bakke. I apologize for uh, not being there. I may have been the one that caused it to be canceled, but uh, I had to go watch the Dragons play basketball. And you should, and you should apologize for apparently yeah. not cheering loud enough, is what my, my feeling is. I, I don't. I watch the ball game. Okay. <laughs> it just happened it. to cross my mind. We have about, what, three or four different areas that we were to discuss. What would happen if after a regular MPS meeting, we adjourned, went down there, spent an hour and a half, two hours, same night, whether we're broadcast or not is, is somebody else's decision. I don't even know if we have to adjourn and go down there. I mean, we can, I mean, that's fine. Well, what, what Dave and I had talked about, he will correct me if I misspeak for him, is that we wanted it a little less uh, a formal okay. uh, a session. And up here, 
it, just by the way we're sitting here, it becomes more formal than down there. And I, I use the city council as an example because when they do their committee of the whole meetings, they move down there. And I think informality is part of the reason why they do that. But I'd offer that as a, as a suggestion. Anybody else? Works for me. Works. Let's yep. do it. Let's do it. How's that? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I'll shut up. Well, we have to get although that may be a goal that some of us have been trying to achieve for a long time. <laughs> well, we're, 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 we have to get it done. We're running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time. Well, and, yeah, yeah. when we come to the water-related issues, yeah. and, I, and, and quite frankly, you know, when we talk about people being out in uh, TV land watching these meetings, I, I had just somebody contact me just in the past week saying they really appreciated the manner in which we discuss some of these issues anyway, and they were amazed. At, and they were talking about Chris's presentations and the way we discussed some of these water-related issues. They didn't realize that we were that involved in those discussions and in those topics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, if we can do that here, let's do it during right after regular meetings and forge ahead. Well, what was the uh, priority? I mean, we had done a little priority listing of the, of the items. Was water number one or, or where were you? The first, I'll just give you the first, uh, actually, I want to give you the first five, but Numbers one and two were water. Uh, number one was water resources. Number two was water infrastructure and just reliability of. Number three was electric infrastructure and the reliability of that. Number four was the uh, implementation of new technologies. There's some things to talk about there. Number five was uh, strategies for attracting, retaining workforce. Mm -hmm. And we just had another lineman uh, announce that they're leaving us and it's a you know another one of those in the core group that 40 to 50 year old uh, one of our lead linemen leaving to go to an, another cooperative so uh, I mean I, that's why I wanted to get to the top five because that that is the one that we're kind of well you had like closely. 11 and we were going to pare yeah. it down to like four to five so right. forget the 11 uh, let, let, let's talk about those five issues let's get those things on the table let's schedule one of those topics for every meeting? Is that what you want to do? Yep. Or forge that ahead? Was, that was my suggestion. The fact that we've had three, two, and two and soon to be have three uh, presentations on water, I would suggest that they are perhaps as best prepared as any of the division. They would go first, and then we do electrical, and then yep. uh, let Bill and Ken decide what the third one would be, and that would be all the other issues that we may have. So, so this was your idea, not necessarily Dave's, because we don't really listen to Dave all that much. <laughs> you know. um, he speaks so well. I understand that, yeah. Well, yeah, and if Chris is ready, I, we'll, we'll go on the, the, the one follow-up topic that Chris has for tonight. I, I think that's a great idea. I really do. I think it's a great way to do it, and whatever works. Let's do it. And, you know, it's, it's sort of frightening when you hear the news reports that 88% of Minnesota is about this far away from drought conditions. And uh, look at the red, it speaks for itself right now. It's certainly not out of its banks uh, by a long shot. No, we're actually prepared to do the, the first of those types of meetings tonight. If you wanted to move item 8E to the end of the meeting, we can come down here afterwards and uh, begin our discussions. My thought would be that we continue this meeting as, as, as planned. Sounds good. <laughs> and that at our next meeting, we will focus on whatever that next topic is and roll up our sleeves and talk about the issues before us because we have some very large issues to grapple with. And, and, our, and the people of Moorhead should be aware of that. Let's, let's focus on those next. And I, I propose that the first meeting be about water. Yeah. Because yep. we have the, uh, I mean, we, had, we don't, so just ever sense, we do not have an issue with water supply at this point, right? If the river runs dry tomorrow, we are fine. Well, but it's a longer term issue that we need to address from an infrastructure perspective and from a water supply perspective. Yeah. And then maybe we'll some time, time, time lines there. And I think that would be a good meeting. I mean, you are invited anyway. You and Chuck are invited anyway. Because I think that's an issue we, yep. it's, it's an issue that goes beyond, in my opinion, go, goes even beyond us uh, sitting Yeah, there. I would suspect that some of the newer members of the council, and newer, I'm going to say, going back a couple of elections anyway, probably aren't fully aware of the depth and magnitude of the water-related issues that face more public service and the manner in which we approach those. And as many people as want to be present can certainly join in. Did you have a comment, Heidi? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly uh, kind of reiterate what Ralph was saying um, or add to what he was saying. Uh, a lot of people, ever since the, the whole California drought, uh, when they, it was announced that they were 
they needed to cut their, their, their water usage by 25% or so. It's amazing how many people in the community have started asking questions about, well, what happens if the river runs dry? Do we have enough water? Uh, so people are starting to ask that question and, and would like to know uh, more specifics and more details. And, uh, and people should ask those questions. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a very uh, concerning question. It, it, it's a very uh, logical concern. Uh, I believe Fargo just had a <coughs> conversation about their water supply. Um, West Fargo chimed in saying, you know, we've got our aquifer, our little aquifer, we're going to be okay. Um, so there, there's concerns out there. You know, what, what lengths will people go to get water where they know water exists? So. I think in the metro I'd rather be in Moorhead shoes than either of the above that well, you mentioned yeah. by a long shot. Well, that's true. Although um, we are partners in, in some of the North Dakota-based solutions. And, and we have to, we really have to take a serious look at, at, at that relationship because, um, you know, while we, while we feel that we have our own solutions, uh, we actually have a fairly expensive capital need a along those lines if we're going to truly have the infrastructure to support the water supp supply that we're going to need. But we also uh, may end up being obligated to participate financially in a project that that is is being determined on the on the North Dakota side uh, that may or may not really be of of any real service to us, and you know politically it's becoming you know a nightmare over there uh, because of the competition for water in North Dakota. So, you know, I, I it's really important that we start with this uh, yep. so that we can get going on our own strategic plans and and not be be you know entangled in. In, in some plans that, that really probably don't don't benefit us all that much. Well, and then we have the second issue, which is the infrastructure issue, right? I mean, we're sitting we are sitting on an aquifer and we're pumping with 60-year-old pumps, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an issue we need to address as well. And I know that Chris is going to talk about that. So it's not it's not just you know water supply; it's the stuff we have to pump the water out because we need to get it from the well field all the way to the power to the plant. So anyway, sorry. Lots of issues, yeah. and and yeah. I think these things are all recognized by us and. An article that I was reading when you talk about the California drought, I'll be going out there uh, in May. Um, now they're having huge arguments between the farmers in the Delta about running the Delta dry. And, uh, you know, I, if I've got superior water rights to the next guy, I don't care. I'll draw all the water I can to take care of my crops. And, and uh, we have to be on top of the issues here. And I, I agree with Dave. We, there are some political ramifications concerning our relationship going west. There, there are huge costs, no matter what we choose to do, there are huge costs involved. Cliff McLean used to be the big spender. Chris is rapidly becoming that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have to keep an eye on that. So, anything further? Okay. Um, Mr. General Manager, so you will take care of scheduling the next discussion or strategic planning for the next meeting. It will be a water-related issues. I'm assuming it's going to be on water availability and uh, those types of things. And we will have some more background uh, for you this evening uh, under 8E. So Chris has a presentation ready and you can, and then we'll, next meeting we'll meet down here and we'll start talking about some of the stuff that we talked about during these we're not, last three parts, so. Let me ask this, we're not gonna have a facilitator, are we? I just thought it, you know, <laughs> I, I posed the question. You wanna talk about that? Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, other, one other question, and I can go either way. Are, are we going to ask that it be uh, televised? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I think when you give the get to the magnitude of the issues that we are looking at, we have the, the public has to be made aware of those issues, I'm, I and I, I personally believe in the public's right to know all of these topics that we're talking about. So from my standpoint, yes, I would think that would be appropriate. Anybody else feel differently? Okay. Then Bill should contact MCAM to make sure that they can schedule. Okay. On to your report. Okay. Uh, General Manager's report. Um, just a couple of things. Yes. If there's questions on the written uh, materials, go ahead and ask those. Um, just want you to know Thursday, so two, two nights from this evening, we will be having the uh, Capture the Sun Community Solar uh, Garden public meeting here from like 5.15 to 6 o'clock, fairly informal, uh, inviting people to come and 
learn more about the uh, Community Solar Garden Project. So if they would like to subscribe to or license a, a solar module, I guess a panel or a module, uh, they can do so that evening or uh, some other you know, day as well. So we'll continue to get the word out, but we're trying to, uh, to get 40 or 80 of those licensed. And uh, so that should be an interesting evening. That, uh, that's this Thursday right here. Um, the uh, other, probably other couple items, uh, street lighting, you know, of course the city started a street light utility this year. We've been meeting with the, the city regarding uh, different street light uh, issues. Um, there's questions in Oakport about, you know, who's providing street lights up here. Of course, uh, with Oakport, uh, we're not serving that area yet, so we're not providing street lighting. That will remain with uh, XL Energy and Red River Valley Cooperative uh, for the time being until we uh, acquire that territory. But we are working on a number of street lighting standards and those types of things. We'll continue to give you updates on that as it moves forward. Um, speaking of Oakport, I will be meeting with uh, Lauren Brorby, uh, Red River Valley Cooperative Power Association's CEO on Friday. Uh, what we're going to try to do is you know, get some information together, get our ducks in a row before we meet with the committee again. Um, good news, I guess, uh, Elk River, and it's public now, Elk River, Minnesota, uh, just settled on acquiring about 2,000 customers around uh, that are inside the city of Elk River from the cooperative there, and they did that for 21 mills, which is a nice, uh, uh, you know, a nice number to at least uh, be talking about. So There's a nice ring to it. Yeah, it had a nice ring to it. It's lower than what we've uh, done in the past. Um, last thing, uh, some one of the commissioners mentioned, possibly mentioning this, is that uh, we would like to make sure everyone's safe this uh, spring. And uh, there was an incident where we had a power outage because a kite uh, got tangled up in our uh, distribution lines, electric distribution lines. So from a safety standpoint, that's a very dangerous uh, situation, nobody was hurt, uh, but that doesn't mean that the next time it, uh, people won't be hurt. And it did cause an inconvenience because it was, uh, uh, there was a you know, good sizable outage that occurred. Um, so everybody just make sure you're safe around power lines is probably the message. Okay. And that's all I have for now. Okay. Bill. Yep. Can we do some public service announcements uh, regarding some of that safety issues or anything like that? Um, you know, Public service announcements, I suppose we've talked about that. I mean, I know we used to do safety programs in the schools, and uh, of course, kite flying was one of the things that we... Uh, there are those of us who would like to reinstitute that program. Yep, yep. Well, and it's, you know, it's a costly thing to do, but from a safety standpoint, I mean, you don't want anyone uh, hurt. Uh, when it comes to a matter of saving well. a child's life, I don't th think that cost is out of line at all. Right, right. This is actually uh, press worthy. I, 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 I think, you know, given that we've had an incident and it does involve public safety, that, uh, that we really ought to just to be putting the together the, the you know, uh, press releases and calling our friends at the press and, and getting the word out that you know, care and safety are, are important. So I, 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 I maybe go just a step beyond that. I think John's Casey's already on that. Let's, uh, let's do press. Are you, Casey? Sure. Thank you. We could get video of Les flying a kite. There you go. You know? yeah. and, and the number of people that have told Les to go fly a kite. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he could about wear a Ben Franklin that'd be, that'd be a long one. I understand. <laughs> Are we going to talk about squirrels, too? Well, there's nothing we can do about the squirrels. They don't read. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> oh, yes, there is. <laughs> they don't watch TV. So uh, you, you're planning on having a squirrel stew at your house, are you? What do you mean? I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. And Joe kills a lot of squirrels every year. That's all I got to say. Move on to your yeah, okay. yeah, so. Now we're down to item 8E, uh, which is to accept a report on future water supply strategic discussion. This is exactly what we were talking about a few moments ago. Chris, I think you should identify yourself, and we'll just simply turn this over to you. And uh, you've got a number of very important issues that you had better get ready to discuss in the very short future. Sure. Christopher Knutson, Water Division Manager, and um, great introduction by the Commission. There's uh, certainly a lot of interest in water issues with the uh, California drought 
um, and some of the concerns related to uh, supply in California for both agriculture and municipal suppliers alike. Um, so a lot of utilities there forced with hard decisions in terms of water supply and, and whether they look to things like desalinization or water reuse. Um, some expensive choices are having to be made right now uh, in terms of water supply. And, and tonight we're really going to be talking about um, what are our future options at Moore Public Service for uh, water supply. So part, tonight we're actually going to be talking about part three of the uh, water supply series and I think this is where we really get to kind of the nuts and bolts of the conversation in terms of uh, what are some of the financial implications of, of potential water supply projects for Moorhead and when do we think they're going to be needed. Um, in the first part of the series we really focused on uh, the Red River Valley water supply uh, project, some of the details of, of that particular project um, and then in the second uh, meeting. Uh, we looked at um, some of the modeling components of the Buffalo Aquifer Management Plan uh, and the recent updates to the uh, model for that plan and, and what implications it has for our future water supply. Um, but as I mentioned tonight, we'll really be talking about some of the, the budgetary com considerations. And I think for Moorhead, it's really a question of um, which direction do we go, west or, or east? And so I, I just kind of put this little infographic up and. Where it's kind of in the in the middle of the Missouri River to the west and the, the Buffalo Aquifer to the east, and and really, which direction do we go in terms of, of future water supply? Assuming not to scale. Not to scale. No, I think I made our GIS guy cringe a little, but uh, it's art, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, just getting back to uh, refreshing a little bit from um, part two of the series, we really focused on the modeling component of uh, the Buffalo Aquifer and, and the question was really can the Buffalo Aquifer supply Moorhead's needs for a 10 year uh, drought which was experienced in the 1930s and, and is a, a good model for what a future drought for Moorhead might look like. Um, and, and we'll talk about the, the most significant finding of that report in the next slide but really um, even in a drought situation, we're going to need, you know, an additional uh, four and a half million gallons per day of max day capacity or about one million gallon per day of, of average day capacity going into 24, 2040. We're going to need that um, regardless of a drought or not. So this is a water supply project that, you know, we'll definitely need in a drought, but, you know, with future growth and more it is growing, uh, we're, we're going to need some additional supply uh, regardless. So I think we've got those two alternatives. We can look at the Buffalo Aquifer expansion or we can look at uh, the Red River Valley water supply project. And first we're going to talk about the um, Buffalo Aquifer expansion. We've put together some alignments and some potential costs for both projects. So we can kind of do an apples to apples comparison of what, what the cost of both projects might look like. So I think if you were going to pick one slide out of part two of the series um, that was the most critical slide. I, I think this would be it. And, and the 1930s drought that Moore had experienced uh, was about a 10 year drought. The question was could we have d enough capacity in terms of a 10 year drought to meet our demands? And this slide says yes, essentially we do have about 9.2 years of capacity pumping 6.5 million gallons per day um, with very limited recharge. That capacity is there, but we have to go get that capacity. And going and getting that capacity means we're going to have to add some additional infrastructure because right now we can only pump about five and a half million gallons per day. And this graph, yeah, go ahead. So I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the question, you're talking about taking 5.5 million gallons of water per day out of the Buffalo Aquifer. I would assume that we, if we are in drought conditions, we would probably impose some types of restrictions on the utilization of water and, and ask our people to conserve water. Under those circumstances, how many gallons would we actually need if we are able to conserve? Is 5.5 a conservative number or is 5.5 what we consider to be the number that we're used to right now? Um, five, you, you know, we would go through all the steps of conservation, so, you know, limited you know, no watering lawns, you know, probably restriction of industry and those types of things. But you'll still need to
to meet fire flow capacities. Fire flow capacities are what drives that number. So that five and a half is probably a realistic number in terms of a fire flow capacity. And we could certainly, we could look at that a little bit um, further if that's desired. But that's, that's really the basis for where we come up with those numbers. It's not driven um, necessarily by what, what's needed for every, everyday use. It's what's needed for a, a significant industrial fire like we experienced several years ago. Okay. Um, that would need that type of that type of flow. That's a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of what expansion of the Buffalo Aquifer uh, would look like, um, we thought a lot about this internally uh, with with staff and and looked at some of our options. And I think the most, if we were going to pursue uh, Buffalo Aquifer as a potential water supply or further water supply option, a critical, critical component to that project would have to be uh, drinking water revolving fund financing um, because the savings on the magnitude of this project would be substantial. So if we're in the 20 to $30 million range in terms of a project, it would save between five and $7 million uh, of additional funds for the, this type of project. So one of the initial decisions we made looking at it was if we're going to go for this type of project, it would probably be best if we could use that drinking water revolving fund financing um, because the interest rate is so competitive. Um, but we looked at uh, um, essentially three alignments we'll talk about tonight. Um, there's some variations in terms of the size of the line of the pipeline that we have for each alignment, the locations of the uh, respective alignments. But for each of them, um, we kind of set uh, basic just $30,000 of initial O&M costs and then about $450,000 of periodic maintenance over the 40 year service life. So we looked at, um, we'll talk about two, two sets of numbers tonight, initial capital costs and then 40 year life cycle costs. So you'll see a lot of numbers floating around, um, but the 40 year life cycle cost is kind of cradle to grave expense of what's, what's the expense of the project over the entirety of the project itself and and really maintenance uh, annual maintenance and O&M charges kind of go into that 40 year uh, expense but the first numbers we'll talk about in terms of the Buffalo Aquifer expansion are the initial capital investments required um, so we just put together some budget numbers for those but essentially the 40 year project cost for any uh, expansion to Buffalo Aquifer that that we came up with would be about 25 to to 20 Seven and point seven million dollars uh, in terms of a, a forty-year life cycle uh, cost for those projects, and we we did our in, our own internal estimates. We had to use a lot of um, Western North Dakota bid numbers in terms of uh, projects that they're doing out there because there, quite frankly, isn't a lot of projects going on around here. So, um, you know, if we were going to err on one side, we'd probably be a little bit on the high side in terms of a overall estimate for these projects. Here's what we came up with for initial capital uh, investments. So this, this would be basically what it takes to build the project, no maintenance included in any of these numbers, just what's the initial uh, investment that would be required for each of these alignments. And you can, you can kind of tell actually the difference between these three respective alignments of adding capacity. It's, it's rather subtle. I mean, it's within a few million dollars of each other. It's not, it doesn't make a big difference in terms of uh, the actual alignment itself. There's just so much uh, expense tied into well field development, um, the piping, um, all of the different expenses that go along with it that the actual alignment itself doesn't make a ton of difference. And one of the key components of the project um, that we felt to get the drinking water revolving fund financing was to actually include the South Buffalo uh, transmission pipeline replacement as part of the project. So that pipeline carries water right now, was put in in the 1950s. Um, and we've had several breaks on that particular piece of infrastructure. We just felt if we're gonna go forward on this type of project, we might as well capture that as well. So that those costs also include that additional either replacement or uh, we came up with some ideas where we could just leave the line in place and not replace it, we could actually capture uh, that flow somewhere else. So I'll look at um, each of the three alignments and they're not meant to be um, perfectly detailed or capture all of the 
um, the design elements of the respective alignments, but they're meant to more suggest uh, the complexity of the route, how many uh, interferences we're gonna encounter, what kind of construction method we would use to do it. So the, <clears throat> I'll start off with the most expensive and kind of go to the least expensive. And um, two things to pay attention to on this graph, I know there's a lot of things going on, or actually this uh, map, but the green line represents easements we've already acquired through uh, other projects. The red lines are the part of the alignment that don't have easement associated with them, so we'd have to purchase those easements. Um, but when you look at the total project costs, easements are such a small portion of the project, you know, probably $100,000 of the entirety of the project is captured in easements, so not a huge budgetary consideration, but maybe a, a timing consideration. The um, dots are just rep meant to represent uh, either cased or uncased bores where we'd have to um, put in the alignment via uh, directional drilling. And then if we encounter obstructions, we have to put in bends or fittings. So the more dots, generally, the more interference uh, we're, we're encountering with that particular alignment. So you can see as we get into Moorhead uh, with the Sa Sabin alignment, we encounter quite a few uh, interferences or other utilities that we'd have to move around. And that, that generates additional cost um, with each respective alignment. So save an alignment, uh, about $21 million of, of initial capital investment required. The South Buffalo alignment, actually, <coughs> we would use the existing South Buffalo line as kind of a, um, we, we would use that same alignment on the north portion of it and replace that pipeline as part of it. So we just, it's an existing 16 inch pipe. We probably put in a 24 inch brand new pipe in place of that 16 inch pipe. Um, so that'd be a one port portion of the project. The rest of it would be um, an additional well field south of our uh, existing wells on Highway 10 and then just a little bit to, uh, to the east. So that additional well field would be uh, south of the interstate, right? Yep, yep, just slightly south of the interstate. And there was, you know, there's some caveats with all these alignments. Um, there was some contamination there at one time at the truck for the truckers in contamination. So uh, one portion of the project would be we'd have to definitely do some test wells to evaluate water quality at that site. And certainly if we're gonna invest, you know, several million dollars into a well field, we would wanna make sure that investment is, is well placed and that there's no contamination present, uh, which we wouldn't expect, but we'd wanna do our due diligence, uh, certainly. Uh, the last alignment is actually the North Dilworth alignment, and this is um, this is actually the least costly option of the three at 19.4 million. Again, picking up a well field just south of the interstate, and then taking it north. And actually, this is the alignment where we'd abandon the existing Highway 10 line in place and um, pick up the flow uh, from that well field at that particular point, and then carry it north of Dilworth and, and use a. Uh, just go south of, of uh, 20th Avenue there on 15th Avenue and bring it, uh, we'd actually hook up to our North Buffalo uh, pipeline there just north of the water treatment plant and bring it back down. Um, you know, this is the one that uh, probably has the least obstructions of, of the three. Um, and that's probably why, the, it's likely the reason why it's the cheapest of, of the three. But I think, you know, if you're gonna expand it, we'd, we'd definitely wanna evaluate all these alternatives a little further than what staff has. Um, we've taken a, a, good, a good shot at it, but we'd wanna look at it a little bit further before we absolutely say this is the one. Um, we, would, we would definitely wanna evaluate it a little Let bit further. Let me ask you a question. Let's say, for example, the North Dilworth alignment appears to be the most cost-effective way to go, okay? And we make an election to move in that direction. At some point in the future, 40, 50 years down the road, and Moorhead is looking to acquire more water rights out of the aquifer. Would we still be able to go to the, the Sabin route at that time as an add-on? Or would that take yeah. too much water out? I don't, I, don't see, I don't see why you'd be restricted because, you know, I think the DNR's focus is really on sustainability. So, from my perspective. So, I mean, if we're withdrawing the aquifer in a somewhat sustainable way and we're not withdrawing certain areas more than others, um, you know, that's really gonna be the focus. So if we, if we heavily concentrate, let's just say we wanted to build, put our well field, everything north of Highway 10, we wanted to put all our wells there and we really focused our withdrawals in that area, 
you know, it could be that other people who use the water in that area would be severely impacted. I think that would be looked at more uh, negatively than, you know, a withdrawal, a somewhat even withdrawal throughout the extent of the aquifer. And so um, I think there was a, <clears throat> there was a really good graphic in that modeling presentation where you could see the actual head levels decrease at certain spots. Part of the focus of this um, infrastructure expansion would be to make sure that, yes, we are uh, withdrawing the aquifer at a fairly consistent level throughout so that we aren't negatively impacting agri agricultural influence over here or municipal users um, wherever they happen to be or, or just homes in that area that use the aquifer. Um, so I, that's a long answer to your question, but I think that if we did decide to go north, I don't think it would restrict any future development of the southern portion of the So we would still continue to seek easements that would allow us at some point in time to go south and have those because we've, we've been doing that in recent years and we could use that for some future needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. John. Just for clarification, the proposal is to put in three additional wells? No, so it's actually looking at three different pipeline alignments. So no, the, but I guess maybe clarify as far as the, the cost that you have is to, um, I guess, update our existing facilities and then there was discussion about adding additional locations for wells? Correct. Okay, and that was three different locations? It would be a well field of three focus, you know, three wells within a half mile radius. Okay. So, right. so it would be that plus the replacement of that existing South Buffalo yeah. infrastructure. Okay. So this proposal is having all three of those locations completed. Um, no, I think we would look at one of those. Would one, you? Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That's I just we would choose one of these three alternatives, which That's would correct. include three pumping stations, so to speak. Correct. Okay. Correct. But at the same time, my point in asking the question I did is, let's say, for example, we decide to go north and go to that Dilworth one because of cost or whatever, or the fact that we have the least interruptions in terms of other problems that we're going to foresee in the construction process, that that would still leave us the availability of going south many years down the road if that necess necessity arose. And at the same time, we have to be mindful of our need to protect a very precious resource. Mm -hmm. I mean, the aquifer is, we've built it up over the last 25 years uh, uh, as much as possible. Yeah. Dave. Chris, you know, uh, fast forward to projects complete. We picked the alignment. We've got the field in place so forth. Is there a limit to, to what we will be able to draw? So given given your your concern about growth and consumption and you know, it, it, what what kind of volumes are we going to be allowed to remove from from the aquifer given state state concerns and 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 just maybe overall consumption of the water? I mean, I th I think the the water is there. It's just you have to. I mean, we're, let's just say we build this mm -hmm. like you proposed. Mm -hmm. I think it would more than satisfy our requirements for additional water through 2050. Okay. If, if let's just say you, we experience some unprecedented growth that's completely unexpected, um, can you go further south and keep getting more water out of the aquifer? Yeah, you, mm -hmm. you certainly can. Um, because the, the, the bottleneck to our withdrawal of water f from the aquifer is the localized withdrawal of a certain area. Right. Yeah. So I if understand. we pull it all north and we can't get you know enough capacity here we just keep going south okay there's more water and, and that raises an interesting question with regard to the red river because i would assume and i'm, I'm, I'm sort of assuming for a future commission because i won't be wrong but i'm going to assume that under those circumstances as soon as we were able to withdraw water again from the red we would do what we've done in the past which would be to discontinue using the well fields as much as possible to allow a recharge out there and then take from the red which eventually might lead us to some very interesting questions with regard to our neighbors to the west who have a different water rights uh, view than we do. Um, effectively in North Dakota, they've got unlimited rights for as much water as Fargo could ever dream of with, withdrawing, 
we, because we have eastern water rights on the red, have a different set of circumstances to operate under, and we will be limited to the amount of water we can draw out of the red unless we go to DNR and get more permits to draw additional water. Am I correct? You're correct, yeah. Okay. There's a limit to how much Red River water we can take. We have a limit. Fargo does not uh, from the red. And, uh, and, 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 and that, could, that could, well, yeah, the bottom of the river, but I'm talking about in, in, in other years. And so we, we have to be mindful of those implications. The possibility exists that we might go north to uh, acquire another transmission line out of the red back to the plant, as opposed to being south, for other reasons. At what level does our intake in the river run out of water? I think it's like, I think it's about seven feet. If about six seven. or seven feet, we yep. lose suction on that line. And, so, and where are we now? Because the river's like, down three, four feet. I think it's like, 14, don't quote me on this, but I think it's like 14 and a half feet. Okay. So it, it, would, it would still have to drop significantly. I mean, we'd still have to, it would take some time to, to lose the flow of the river. I mean, a, a year before we, a year or more. We have to just watch the discharges on Traverse and those things, but there's still plenty of, I mean, if we had a drought this year, it'd be an agricultural drought. It wouldn't impact us this year going into next year, certainly we could have. Are there comparisons, uh, you know, it's, it's only mid-April, you know, we didn't have really much snow at all this year. There's no runoff to speak of. Right. And the river is really significantly lower than we generally ever see it in April. Uh, so it, it, are, are there, are there any, any measurements that, that, that are being tracked by people that do that uh, to, oh, to, to really start to try to forecast what the river is doing? I mean, I think I heard on the news last night that it's mm -hmm. like the third driest spring or since <coughs> since last fall, it's the third driest on record. It's like the third um, driest six month period on record. Yeah. And Grand Forks is the driest on record. That's right. So, I mean, <clears throat> if you look at the drought index, um, it's updated daily, I believe, on, on the uh, US um, National Weather Service website. You know. California, those areas are like bright red, extreme drought. You know, we're still would be on the the yellow or kind of early to moderate drought. Mm -hmm. And again, if we experience a drought this year, it'll be an agricultural drought, not a drought that will impact us because of the storage that is in our reservoir in Traverse and some of those sources to the south. So there's still plenty of water available there, but you know, we'll just see how the year plays out. In terms of, uh, you know, w what an expansion would look like in terms of timing, um, you know, if, if kind of as um, operators and, and utility, if we had our kind of dream wish, we'd take five or six years to, to extend this project out and do it in a really thoughtful way. Um, but certainly we could condense the project timeline probably down to two or three years if, if necessary, if we uh, did hit a drought situation. But kind of our dream scenario of, um, is, is on the bottom where we look at, you know, finishing the aquifer management plan, which we're planning on doing this year. Um, we look at doing some test wells and a preliminary engineering report on the alignment um, when we initiated this project. And that would be kind of the beginning of the five-year uh, pro process of um, generating the project. And then we'd have to go out and look at financing options, design it, construct it, and then, and then finish it. So kind of a probably a five-year project if we have our way, and if we need to, it could be a two or three-year project. Um, in terms of what the rate increases would be to kind of to fund this type of project, we're looking at about seven, five percent uh, rate increases to fund it. And, you know, we've got some of the uh, rate increases kind of in our long-range plan in terms of funding the water main asset management plan through 2019. And then we have some other ongoing costs associated with the high service pump station project that have our water rate increases, I believe, at the five to six and a half percent level for the through 2019. So I think be, you know, this is a discussion topic for the commission, obviously, um, but it would maybe tough to put that type of rate impact on the rate payer. Um, but that's the type of rate increases that would be uh, required to fund that magnitude of project, even with the uh, drinking water uh, revolving fund funding. So switching gears a little bit, um, moving on to the Red River Valley water supply. For this uh, 
project, we actually had to kind of look at two different estimates um, in terms of a cost estimate, kind of a best case scenario, everything goes right in a worst case scenario. And I wish we could be more comprehensive in the way we evaluated that, but um, to do that would really take probably some external study that goes beyond uh, MPS's resources in terms of evaluating it, um, which we could do, but this is kind of the way we looked at the, the project. Um, the biggest difference I would say is uh, for this type of project, we'd probably be stuck with traditional bond financing, which again would probably increase the cost uh, between five and seven million dollars just if we looked at the exact project cost for each project, um, having that uh, additional interest rate would, would cost a, a significant amount of money. In terms of what the res <coughs> Red River Valley water supply fixed cost is, you know, this is just um, a little bit of speculation on my part, but we looked at about $11.2 million of initial cost um, just with the treatment plant and then the our portion of that transmission line. That's what the fixed cost would be. Um, and that was based on uh, the 2012 uh, value engineering study. Um, we'd have to get that water to our plant in some ways, so we'd have about $5 million in cost in terms of getting that water from the Fargo water treatment plant uh, to the Moorhead water treatment plant. And that's a, that's a good, est that's a really, um, I would say, reasonable estimate for that um, project. And then I took a shot at estimating the uh, operations and maintenance costs of both the water treatment plant and the pipeline. And that's uh, rather significant, about $165,000 a year. And this is, this is split between all the partners. So um, I should have mentioned that this, my assumptions for the Red River Valley Water Supply Project include um, the state funding the project as the federal government would have back in 2007, 2005. So we're assuming that the state has plenty of revenues to support the project. We're just paying the local share of the $200 million or, or whatever they decide it to be um, between Fargo and all the other local partners uh, of the project. And in the best case scenario, uh, we came up with a 40-year project cost of about $38 uh, million on the best case scenario for the Red River Valley Water Supply Project. In terms of the worst case scenario, um, again, many of the same uh, parameters that we use for the best case scenario, the biggest distinction is we'd have to, just assuming that we can't get the water at the Fargo Water Treatment Plant, we'd have to go get it at, uh, at the Cheyenne because the assumption of the Red River Valley Water Supply Project is that they put it into the Cheyenne River, so we have to get a pipeline all the way out to probably um, near where Fargo's intake on the Cheyenne is. I took a stab at estimating that at about $30 million. Um, so that really adds to the, the cost of the project when you factor everything else in and you get a 40-year project cost of about $98 um, million in terms of a total project cost. Now what the reality of that might be between the 38 and the 90, $98 million that I've come up with, that would take some, in my opinion, some significant resources to figure out what exactly those costs would be. So I, they are, those numbers are somewhat speculative, but they are. What, what, what I came up with. Um, in terms of some of the unknowns of the Red River Valley Water Supply Project, I looked at some of the water quality things um, with the Missouri River and the Cheyenne River. Again, you're mixing those two sources so we don't know the exact result of what the water quality would be, why that matters to Moorhead, <coughs> Fargo, um, Grand Forks and Valley City are all putting in membrane uh, filtration style plants that are capable of removing sulfate. Sulfate will be the big concern with Cheyenne uh, River water. So we'd have to invest maybe 20 to $40 million of additional expense beyond um, the either 38 or 90 to get a treatment plant capable of removing that sulfate. And from my best guess, it's, it's speculating what the net result of mixing the, the Missouri River coming from the, uh, the Missouri River coming from um, Washburn and the Cheyenne River water is that we'd probably need to, to put that treatment plant in because the Cheyenne River, um, since the installation of that Devil's Lake outlet, has been around 500 to 800 parts per million of sulfate. The uh, secondary contaminant limit for sulfate is around 250, so no matter how we mix it, even if we blend Buffalo Aquifer water with it, we just can't get below that limit, in my estimation. Um, 
Doesn't the water out of the Cheyenne go directly into the Fargo water treatment facility? They, yeah, they have a they have an intake on the Cheyenne. Okay, correct. so the, and that's why I'm asking the question: Are there are there treatments within that facility then removing those uh, contaminants? Would we have to design around? Because if it goes through their system when it comes back into the red, isn't it going to be cleaned? Isn't the water treated? I'm I'm saying so the. So let's just say. I know it goes in with what? It's going to come back out into the river, however, when it goes through the sewage system. Yes. Oh. I, yeah, I, I don't. I guess I'm unclear as to that, that question, but I would just say that, I mean, once they get there, so they're, let's just assume that the Red River Valley Water Supply Project has been built. We mix that water, that Missouri River water with the Cheyenne River water. The sulfate level is probably 400 ppm. Fargo, with their new treatment plant, can take that sulfate down to zero if they want. Okay, but that's what I'm saying, is that that water is not going into the red as untreated water. Right. So it's going through their treatment facility. Correct. So if our intake was sited north of their outfall, so to speak, would we be, I mean, we wouldn't have those contaminants, would we? North of their wastewater outfall, or yeah. their yeah, yeah. Um, because they got to treat that water before it goes back in the red. You wouldn't want to do. That. I mean, there'd be a whole another range of issues going <laughs> yeah. north of their it's wastewater. Right. You want it before their wastewater. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's. I kind of I get where you're going, but I it'd be hard. That's that's a hard speculation for me to look Brad at. Brad Forks gets that stuff. So. Yeah. Well, exactly. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's getting it, but the question is whether or not they're getting the contaminants that are the Missouri River contaminants or the Devil's Lake Basin contaminants, because those are coming out when they go through the Fargo Water Treatment Facility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but they're putting stuff, stuff in, in the I understand that, but, but if you, if you, yeah, but, but when it goes through that process, they also have to clean that water because there are standards that they have to meet before they inject it back into the Red River, correct? For, for North Dakota? Never mind. No, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, <laughs> <my question. laughs> Chris uh, let's go down a whole other uh, uh, rat hole here. Um, how about the Canadian question and, and, and our international uh, relations? And, you know, I mean, you know, talking about bringing water over the divide and, you know, putting it in Ashtabula and treating it is one thing, but, but actually getting the international uh, okay to do that? It seems, uh, my, I, my understanding is, is something entirely different. I, I think there's going to be challenges, and I, uh, you know, I think. Th or the state of Missouri, or, you know, whoever. Yeah, you know. we have to be able to. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, the next slide was uh, focused on those very, oh, okay. uh, very challenges you brought up, but certainly we can discuss it right now. I mean, you know, the Canadians uh, definitely took uh, issue with the Devil's Lake outfall that was put in place in terms of the impact that it had to the Red River water quality going into Canada. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's very hard to speculate on that, but I certainly think they, they could and would take issue uh, with <clears throat> transporting that Missouri River water across the basin uh, to the Red River Basin. They very well could. Yeah. You know, along with, you know, there, there's still some federal conflicts that they, you know, for the Red River Valley Water Supply Project, because the strategy has been to avoid any federal nexus, i.e. they don't want to fill out any federal permits for the project, they want to do it all themselves. Right. Um, they being North Dakota and all of the local partners, there could be some federal challenges as well, um, along with southern states that use the, the Missouri. Certainly there's, there's a multitude of challenges that could take place, but it's difficult when you get into the legal arena to speculate, um, you know, which ones are be, would be valid and which ones won't, you know, I, I don't know. From my perspective, they all have the potential of delaying the project significantly. So, when we get into this in our uh, in our strategic planning, um, can can we bring this down to some equations and and just some comparisons of this choice versus this choice and such, so that we can look at a Moorhead solution versus a Red River Valley water supply project solution versus you know whatever else might be out there, so we can maybe just start to mark mark some options off and grapple with it yeah <clears throat> certainly we can yeah we can certainly discuss that more um try to try to definitely from a cost perspective 
put both of them side by side to compare compare them from a cost perspective. Um, so I guess I, I'll look, we can discuss it maybe after the meeting as to what you're exactly looking for in terms of the well, comparison. Well, you, you, you know, basically decision making, but you know, but a part of that is the dynamic of our relationship uh, to the other players in the Red River Valley project and and what they're depending on us for and and I guess the timing, you know, just to be good neighbors, you know, how is it that we either endorse and embrace and move forward with them or how do we how do we say, you know, guys, uh, this really this really isn't 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 our game plan. And, and, you know, and how do we yeah. and how do we do that? Um, and and continue to be you know good neighbors. I, th I think that's a board level decision that mm -hmm. I think you know we'll certainly recommend what what we think as staff uh, would be the best path forward. But yeah, yeah I, I think that's definitely board appropriate decision. What kind of conversations do we have to have awesome. with them in order to um, consider the, all those options? Are, it, it, are there some face to face? Well, I think if things we made, that we need to do. Uh, yeah. I think if we if we made a decision or got closer to a decision that we were going to go the aquifer way, yeah. we we need to uh, inform. And I mean, I don't know what an issue would be. I know there's other parties who want to be part of that project, whether it's Jamestown or, or Valley City. Mm -hmm. I I don't think that. I mean, just talking out loud here, I don't think if we decided to not participate that that would jeopardize in any way. The project itself. I think there I don't, will be enough. I don't think so. If yeah. that's the question, yeah, I, I, think I would agree enough. with you. Yeah, there'll be enough uh, other players to to be interested in it. And uh, but again, that's that's out there. Um, yeah, I, I think it would be maybe a surprise, but I don't think it would be a jeopardize the project at all. Without I, sounding I, provincial, I suppose one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is which is the best route for Moorhead to take for the benefit of Moorhead. Yeah from a cost standpoint and also taking into consideration what's happening in the valley and, and quite frankly what's happening politically in, in North Dakota. The, the legislature doesn't seem oh, yeah. to be trying to benefit anybody other than whomever they're trying to benefit. I don't think anybody's figured that out yet. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and, and quite frankly, even on, the, on the, the Minnesota side, when you look at the funding for bonding projects and so forth, the, uh, the Minnesota legislature is acting somewhat schizophrenic as well. And you know what are they going to be willing to do? We've got huge issues facing Moorhead, whether it's trains or water. One of the questions I'm going to be interested in hearing you answer is if we are moving toward a drought situation where we may have to either accelerate our program or at least focus on that program, which program is going to, or which project is going to take us to that end location with the best amount of speed. I mean, if you're looking at the Missouri River equation, that may be tied up in wrangling for the next 20 years mm -hmm. because there are people in the southern states who absolutely do not want that to happen, even though it's a minimal amount of water. For that matter, the North Dakota legislature has not seen fit to fund things past Jamestown anyway. So, I mean, what what is the best route for us to take? Timing gets to be important if, in fact, we're looking at a water-related issue. And the dynamic certainly has changed for um, Fargo as well because now they can look at using the Devil's Lake Basin as somewhat of as an additional reserve for, for water supply that they didn't have before. So I think with the addition of their treatment facility that can treat sulfates, they now have more water capacity for a drought-type situation. So I think things have definitely changed from a few years ago. Um, in terms of Fargo, I don't know the, the funding component from the North Dakota legislature, but as Ralph mentioned, I don't think us backing away from the project would jeopardize the project if they decide to go forward. Um, Do we anticipate that Minnesota, if, if they're going to, if Fargo decides to use Devil's Lake Basin water, do we anticipate Canada jumping into that with both feet, as well as Minnesota, in terms of the DNR for the quality of water that's now going to be placed in the red? There, I mean, they'll, they'll be doing it once that plant is done. I mean, it's it's already, but the they're plant, already using Cheyenne water. But the plant anyways. would resolve the big issue, which is self it's right? The plant will yeah. pull them out, and so you don't have that issue. That goes back to my it point. Actually, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, well, you want to do things that are <laughs> different. 
being done elsewhere. <laughs> we do that sale. Uh, so I think that would be less of an issue. But um, um, but from a timing perspective, and that may be 20 years or 15 years, and uh, we may have to make a decision. Now, again, we have water in the aquifer. We have good water for seven years. I think that was without even additional well fields. So yeah. you know, we don't have to move today, but we have to make that decision. Yeah. And, and I've said this a number of times, too, uh, back to, to Heidi as well. I mean, this is the kind of decision that this board will have to make, but it will need input from, or, or at least acknowledgement from the council that this is a big ticket item. But right? if we decide to go one way or the other, you know, hopefully we'll have 10 years of water in the aquifer, and hopefully the studies are right, and hopefully there's no benzene in the aquifer and all that stuff. But it's a it's a big ticket decision. And I think you know we, we do have time to make this decision. I don't want to suggest that it's an urgent decision that we need to make today. Um, you know, when Cliff did a report similar to this. Uh, seven, eight years ago, they said, hey, 2015 is the date you need to decide something by. And so we're, we're in 2015, but I think the decision can be deferred until either you know, a drought situation occurs or something, something provokes us to make the decision. I, I think the decision can be put off until really the time is right for MPS. Whatever factors we decide, we can make the decision at that point. I think only, the only decision that, I, that I'm concerned about um, is, is the one with our neighbors. Know, so that they know whether we're in or out. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that one is a little bit more pressing time-wise because because the issue for them is is becoming a pressing one, um, I agree. especially after uh, you know recent weeks in the North Dakota legislature and the governor's plan with the fertilizer plant and and, and all of the wrangling that's been going on with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I just I, I just think it, that it'll be a responsibility of ours to to fish or cut bait on that one and move on. It's amazing that fertilizer plants take priority over <laughs> and water I think, resources. I think that's the type of input we're looking for from the board. Is yeah. is I have it in the, um, the next slide here is just, you know, <laughs> if we're going to stay involved in the, in the Red River Valley Water Supply Project, really what, to what extent do we want to stay involved and, and, and what budgetary commitment do we want to provide to the project? And I think it would be fair to the partners in the project to let us, you know, let them know what our level of involvement will, will potentially be. Um, so I, I think you've kind of taking care of a lot of the points of my last few slides for me, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Is there one question? I thought. The couple of points that you've made, though, Chris, is that we are going to have to have a substantial investment in our existing facility sometime mm -hmm. in the future. So the, the this is not a question of if. Yeah. No. So I think that's you know has to be kept all in the scope of this process because we're going to want to keep those aquifers up to date and current so we don't have a failure and there's going to have to be substantial costs associated with that. Yeah, when you know we began the talk we talked about 2040 man. So I mean this is we're looking out 15 years. This is the type of project that you do once every 15 20 years. So I mean it's a big decision and I agree I think it's important to emphasize that yeah, we will need to make it sometime in the next 15 years. It's just you know, what's the decision and, and when do we do it? I'm suggesting that, you know, 2020 may be a, a good time to start the project unless we have a, a drought situ situation that, that well, happens. But your numbers are based upon what's available now. When you look at uh, obtaining the, the funding from the Minnesota Financing Agency that you're looking at obtaining it from, and you're talking about 1.5%, 2%, whatever that is, that's today's numbers. Right. In 2020, we might be dealing with an entirely different financial world. Yeah. In terms of percentages, which will raise that cost. So, you know, on the one hand, when we look at joining with our neighbors to the west, there's huge O&M and other costs that we've not even anticipated yet. We don't have any idea what that's going to be. And then on the other side, we, we're going to have the financing questions on this side. So when you defer, I don't think the cost is going to go down to the residents of Moorhead by doing so. Um, you know, that's never been the history that by waiting a little bit longer, it gets cheaper. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't mean to imply that. Yeah. Just for one, 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 one question too, uh, uh, when we talked about the expansion project, we are, with the exception of replacing the existing uh, Highway 10 line, uh, these costs do not include any of the fixing of the current wells, right? No. 
No, so just the line itself. Uh, but that's an issue that that has to be done between be, before Correct. 2020, right? I mean, like I said, we're sitting on 60-year-old pumps, and we probably should look into if we have to switch over next summer into making it up 100% uh, aquifer water. Can the pumps handle that? Yeah, right. I mean, our plan we put we put probably. Eighty to one hundred thousand dollars on the Highway Ten wells last year, so we could buy another ten years of, of usage out of them. So I think ten years is a reasonable number to expect out of that infrastructure. That's, um, that's kind of but, what we've. But is that ten years of pumping at the rates that are concerning my friend Ralph? I don't. It wouldn't. Ma it wouldn't make too big a difference. Okay. That's true. Yeah. So. That's what they do. That's what they do. <laughs> um. I guess the one the one slide that you know kind of captures it for me. The only, th you know, I just tried to s simplify it in terms of um, life cycle project costs, water quality control costs, litigation. You know, I think the advantages are pretty clearly on the Buffalo Aquifer supply, um, but you know we can certainly further discuss what future actions we want to take. I think in terms of costs, we can control when we can start the project. Um, and the, the, let's just say, lack of litigation associated with this type of project that I, we, I don't think we'd see any. Um. Correct me if I'm wrong, and Bill will tell you how much I like graphs. Um, I don't see any X's over on the right. That's the point. That's Am I the, missing something here? That's the point. Why? Right. Yeah. That's, that's the point. So, I don't see any either. So I, I, are, you, are you telling us that we're sort of going in one direction already? We can if go whatever if direction we were to you ask want me you. to. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm merely providing a recommendation. Yeah. Well, I think as we get to the next meeting as well, we can add a few, uh, a few other actions. risk factors in that decision mm -hmm. analysis that we have mm -hmm. because there's political risks. You know, I mean, your, your partner is North Dakota. Your partner is someone that has different interests than you, and you're a very minority partner. Plus, you're looking at spending 20 million versus spending a minimum of 40 million over there. So, I mean, I think is when we we'll put together some more risks on there because I wrote a few of those down, and I think it's going to be an X under the Buffalo Aquifer expansion on every one of them. So, I mean, it, it there's nothing in my mind that's going to direct us away from that. Um, and when we come to that reality, I don't know when, but I mean that's what we need to talk through. And I don't know if there's anything they can throw on the table really to change that. I don't think it's technically feasible because there's a technical risk as well. I mean, this is pretty easy stuff we're talking about here. But it, once you get across the river and you look at uh, the treatment processes they have to and the operating costs that go along with them, I mean, you've just got huge risks. Well, and the additional treatment costs that we would have to add at our facility right. to meet those requirements. Right. So you'll be ready at our next meeting to tell us what to do? This is a primer for that conversation, I think. <laughs> Chris will never tell us what to do. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. That's, that's a decision for the policymakers. Yeah. He's very, he's very good at that. I like that. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. I guess, you know, oh. the, the, one, the one thing that we would want to discuss, and it's been alluded to, is, you know, what, what extent do we stay involved with the Red River Valley Water Supply Project? I think staff needs some guidance on that particular issue, and I think in terms of timing for the, um, if we do decide to do the Buffalo Aquifer project, when would you like to initiate the process of doing that project? Because it will be, you know, if, like I said, if we can extend that time period out in terms of planning and construction, you make a lot better decisions when you have that amount of time to do the project. You can be more thoughtful about it. You can be more picky. Um, it's just some, just some thoughts for the next dis okay. discussion on the item. Well, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Chris? If, if not, thanks for a, a great report, Chris. Um, could I have a motion, please, to accept Chris's report? We'll move to accept the report. Is there second. a second? second? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those oppose the same sign. Know full well, young man, that we are going to rely on you for a lot of the information that we're going to need in order to put us in the position to make those policy making decisions. That brings us down to item 11.
to approve specifications and authorize the advertisement for bids for equipment recoding at the water treatment plant. And uh, he sh there were some pictures in the packet that uh, sort of are self-explanatory. Yeah, I'm trying to extend the life of some things that have been there for a while. Yeah, Chris Knutson, Water Division Manager. So the our existing plant um, is about 20 years old, and when I say existing, our our new water treatment plant is about 20 years old. And as part of um, the aging process for that plant, uh, we've actually experienced some pretty significant corrosion on two of our uh, treatment processes um, at our treatment plant. Water softening is a, a really critical portion of our treatment. And the softening basin itself is composed of a large number of metal uh, mixing units and, and metal weirs. Um, and those weirs, we've actually lost quite a bit of the coating, probably 50% of the coating on, on those metal um, parts of the structures. And what, what is exposed metal is certainly corroded to a pretty significant extent. So what we want to do um, is recoat that uh, equipment by sandblasting all the existing paint off of that equipment and then uh, applying a two-part um, epoxy um, epoxy paint to the to those um, structures and it'd have about a similar lifetime as to it's very similar to a water tower style paint it's an epoxy uh, when I look coating. at this picture is is that actually rusted through or is it just it has not rusted through it it is a little deceptive that but, yeah, but it, it is not rusted. So through. it's not as bad as it looks. It's not as bad as it looks, but it's in it's need It's a of critical attention. point. Yeah. Okay. Pardon? Yeah. No, I, I, we've got copies here, but we might want to put it on the screen for our people at home. Anybody have any questions for Chris? I think this is fairly self-explanatory, and it's one of those things that we just don't have too many choices about. Yep. It's in the budget, right? It is in the budget, and uh, we did look at some other options in terms of replacing it with stainless steel and some other alternatives and maybe saving costs, but I, this is kind of where we landed in terms of feasible solutions for the next 20 years. Okay. So we think it's going to last about 20 years? Yep. Is there a motion to accept I or to, to approve. approve? Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign? That motion carries, brings us down to item 12. Thank you, Chris. Uh, to approve professional services for a survey of the contaminated material at the old water treatment plant. Who's taking this one? This, this, is, uh, this is my item as well. Chris Knutson, water division manager. Um, Travis and I worked on this item um, actually together, but it's for the essentially the old water treatment plant facility. So as part of the high service pump station project, we're actually removing those old pumps probably um, January of next year or December of this year. We'll be taking out those existing pumps. That'll free up a, a bunch of space for electrical operations and possible expansion of the uh, electrical offices and, and other things that they're looking to do. Um, so before that uh, potential expansion could take place, we want to just survey if there's any asbestos in the old water treatment plant, uh, as well as find out if there's any lead-based paints um, that are on the treatment plant equipment. So we fully expect that we'll find lots of both. Um, but the survey will really help us identify uh, the amount of the material that needs to be abated and then give us some bid estimates for potentially bidding the actual abatement of those materials. Okay, do I have a motion concerning this matter? I move to approve. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign. So one question I have: so electric guys are allowed to be in the water plant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, they can't come into the new plant. Just the one with the asbestos and the lead. Yeah. Sort of, okay. Would sort yeah. of concern just, me that just clarifying this. Yeah. Travis and Chris are working together on this project. Yeah, that's that, scary. Uh, that raises my curiosity. Uh, next is item 13, and to approve a letter of commitment for the Water Use Research Foundation project. Bill, are you requesting this? Chris, Chris is here. Yeah. You don't have to identify yourself this time. I think we all pretty much know who you are tonight. Sick of me at this point. Didn't say that, but <laughs> your words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so this, this is... Um, who is this guy? <laughs> this is an item that's a little bit indirect indirectly related to what we do at More Public Service, but I think a valuable um, research project. 
Water, re water reuse is actually more of a focus in southern states where they have limited supplies. They have to look at you know wastewater recycling for available water supply. Um, that's not the intention of this study. This study is actually focusing on the reliability of certain treatment processes in treatment plants. So it's going to be a good benchmarking opportunity for more public service just to identify um, equipment uptime and equipment reliability in the treatment process. And it'll give some good data to um, those that are interested in potentially doing water reuse uh, type treatment plants. Okay. Members of the commission, what do you think? Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. I'll second it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign. I, I don't believe that we have a meeting, a closed meeting required for tonight. Uh, next Public Service Commission meeting will be April 28th. John has a question. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, on April 16th, as Bill mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we will have the Community Solar Garden Public Meeting. That will be here in the uh, Council Chambers from 5.15 to 6 o'clock. Members of the public are certainly invited to attend. John, you had a question. We have discussed many times so far about arranging a tour of the facilities. And with the discussion that we've had here about the existing, it would be high benefit to, you know, we really appreciate that having it done. So we can put that on agenda for a topic in the future to get scheduled. Yeah, we certainly can. That was a good time to do it because the high service pump station, uh, Chris had Nancy and I over there just the other day, just this week. And they've got things uh, in conjunction with that Heidi I'm really really going to encourage your participation and Chuck's at that because the whole it, council, it, the whole council. Yeah, well the, it is, if we can get as many as we can it's I think it was an eye-opener to several of us sitting up here when we saw the condition of uh, some of those pumps at uh, both the north well and at the other well and I think the council has to understand the, you know wh where we're going with all of that so Really like to see you there, if possible. Yeah. So yes, Casey, would you put that on the agenda, please? To Do we need a facilitator? I, you know, I don't think we will, but you know, somebody may have an idea, so we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.